good morning everyone and uh, welcome to the second session on hydrogen in 24 hours on this plenary table uh, it's very interesting that we are having two sessions on on a similar topic uh, i can only the organizers know why but i can hazard a guess uh, in the overall decarbonization story uh, if there is one a theme that's really, really important. It, it is that beyond electrification, we need molecules. And amongst molecules between biofuels and hydrogen, uh, they have to tell a large part of the story. Hydrogen in particular is important on in this context at the India Energy Week because it is, as, as some of you might have heard uh, Mr. Amitabh Khan speak yesterday, that it is one of those special energy vectors which can allow India to become an exporting country and not just an importing country on energy. Uh, it's over the next two to three decades, it is, we are in this country hoping to kind of use the hydrogen vector as a means of not just uh, decarbonizing ourselves and utilizing for our green purposes, but also taking it to the globe. Uh, with that, let me just quickly uh, kind of introduce uh, the panel. Um, the, the objective today some of you might have seen the hydrogen session yesterday. There was a conversation around it on many, many global issues. Today's panel is very going to be very India-focused. And uh, in that context, I wanted this, this, this panel is really, really equipped to talk about those themes. So maybe I'll start with um, uh, the quick introductions. Mr. First, Mr. Atul Chaudhary on my uh, left. Uh, 20, he's the CTO at uh, Tata Consulting Engineers. 20 years, 28 years, I think, in process industries across, he was previously with Akar, uh, worked across multiple hydrogen projects, okay, very close association with academia. I think he has a lot of interesting thoughts on R&D, which he will share with us as well. Mr. Alberto Modignani, uh, he is a hydrogen VP at Nextchem, uh, a mayor group company. Uh, he has, he is a nuclear engineer <laughs> by training, and I think over the last many years, he's uh, done multiple projects across the world. Uh, on not just hydrogen, but many other kind of energy sources. And we are hoping to tap his expertise in uh, learnings from other geographies for, for the country. Uh, next to him, we have Mr. Alok Sharma. He is uh, Director R&D at IOCL. Uh, three decades, interestingly, he's been the ED at the Center of High Technology, which has been doing a lot of work on uh, cutting edge work at the refineries. He's been responsible for uh, all many topics on hydrogen, gasification, solar, CO2 capture, and energy storage, uh, leading those that thinking and that research at, at IOCL. He's a member of the Indian Association of Hydrogen Energy, as well as the Hydrogen Association of India. Uh, welcome, Mr. Sharma. Uh, then to his left, we have Mr. Lalwani. Uh, Lalwani uh, Ms. Lalwani is the executive director, head, and, head technical and projects at Torrent. Uh, four decades across multiple uh, uh, solar, wind, thermal projects, fertilizer, ammonia in India and the Middle East. And interestingly, Torrent Power is one of those companies which has actually won um, a bid in the site, uh, uh, kind of the Seki auctions recently. And so they are putting where the, their money where, uh, where the mouth is. So they're leading the hydrogen charge in that sense. Uh, and to his left, we have uh, Dr. R.K. Malhotra. Very experienced professional. Uh, he's in fact he's been the ex uh, director R&D at IOCL. Currently he's the director and founder of Carbon U-Turn, uh, which uh, looks to do interesting things around creating a platform for carbon credits. But uh, equally importantly, he's been a DG at FIPI. Uh, he's he's an expert in multiple ministerial committees. Okay, and he's also kind of a pra he's he's a professor uh, at both uh, currently IIT Delhi and I think soon to be hopefully I don't know whether it's uh, IIT Roorkee as well. So we expect to tap his experience in the, in the, on this theme as well. So we have a, a really distinguished and experienced panel today. And what we are hoping to kind of get from this conversation is some interesting thoughts on what needs to be done to take the hydrogen topic forward uh, in India. So with, with maybe we start with a slightly open-ended question before we're getting into specifics on, and tapping the individual experiences. And the open-ended question that I wanted to start uh, with was, as Coming from your unique vantage point, how do you see the hydrogen ecosystem in India evolving and what needs to be done to accelerate it? So if you could just take a few minutes giving your perspectives on the same, right? So maybe you can start with you, Mr. Chaudhary. Yeah, thanks. I mean, uh, uh, hydrogen is not a very new vector. First hydrogen electrolyzer was made about 150 years back. And this clean energy transition has a renewed interest and momentum with respect to deployment 
in several industrial elements, the potential that it brings to decarbonize the industry is tremendous. But there are certain things being the new horizon technology implementation at a highly commercial scale and at a highly large scale. Obviously, what first comes to mind is the costs associated with the generation, cost associated with storage, costs associated with the transportation. It's the whole economy of the cost that needs to be seen. If you talk about the generation, the electrolytic hydrogen generation, most of 50 to 70 percent costs are related to round the clock power availability. About 30 to 50 percent costs are related to the electrolyzer manufacturing. The most important factor, what I believe, is the promotion of research and development framework. We have made an excellent start very recently. The R&D framework for development of these hydrogen electrolyzers have been announced. A lot of targets and KPIs have been set. It is a long roadmap. If India has to achieve the Atmanirbhar technology, the acceleration and fast adoption and encouragement to R&D will prove a very vital point that will definitely bring down the costs associated with round-the-clock energy as well as with respect to electrolyzer manufacturing. And with respect to the creation of the user, creation of the demand, there are a lot of policies that are being discussed. These are still the early days. What the uh, renewable uh, power electricity gen uh, generation has brought the scale. Similarly, the hydrogen scale will also bring down the cost. In the interim, it is very essential to start developing the hydrogen infrastructure in phases. Maybe a short term approach could be the development of clusters, wherein the users are where nearby to the production area. On a long term, obviously, we need to look for development of the pipeline network, similar to natural gas pipelines across the country, and cover it up as the hydrogen transportation. That will make the you know, hydrogen clean energy transition little bit faster, um, uh, faster adop adoption into the country. That's what uh, I feel. Perfect. Uh, thanks, Mr. Jovi. In fact, very interesting themes on R&D and, uh, and cluster development, which we'll come back to later. Mr. Modignani, your th 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 yes. thoughts, please. Thank you, Arun. Uh, so from my perspective, I think <clears throat> we should look um, back and how the low carbon, whether it is green or blue hydrogen industry has been developing during the last I would say five to seven years. Okay. Um, I think that there, there have been um, lots of improvements in, in trying to make uh, the low carbon hydrogen more competitive with respect to the conventional gray hydrogen. There have been uh, lots of improvement from the technology manufacturing industrial point of view, but still we are not there. Still we are not there. Uh, hydrogen, whether it is blue or green, it is, it is too expensive. Uh, most of the projects for, uh, mostly for bankability reasons, uh, the large scale projects have been delayed uh, and are progressing to FID with one or two years of delay in general. If you see them in Europe or in the US, um, there are also other countries like uh, uh, South America which were very promising and still they are almost nowhere in terms of project development. So um, if I look at this, <clears throat> with the perspective of India, I think that there is a lot of uh, potential because India, as a, as a, as a large country with a, a, a big uh, uh, industrial heritage, uh, has the big advantage of the second mover. So we, we, we can really look back at what the uh, low carbon industry, um, hydrogen industry has been doing so far and then take advantage of that. Um, I have seen, for example, several uh, opportunities and discussions about um, making India um, a hub for uh, hydrogen production for export, for example. Uh, if there's, there is not a market directly and in the short term in India for um, green or blue hydrogen applications, certainly there is for, uh, for export. Europe, for example, has ambitious targets um, for um, uh, producing and using uh, millions of tons of uh, low carbon hydrogen at 2050, but only 50% of that can be produced in Europe. So um, cer certainly there will be uh, areas in the world, whether it is Europe or Japan or other countries where India can, can act as a, as, a, as a hydrogen hub for export. And from the manufacturing point of view also, I see <coughs> 
already uh, interesting initiatives that are, uh, are taken uh, in India, whereby in the Indian in industrials are um, connecting with electrolyzer manufacturers to create kind of a licensing agreement whereby the technology, the design of the technology would be coming from the original country and then manufacturing massive manufacturing production in India. So this is something that uh, uh, it is maybe making a change uh, in the way uh, uh, India can position um, as an industrial power in the, in the overall uh, hydrogen sector. And then we do not have to neglect, as uh, you were saying, the potential of, of R&D, the potential of universities, which is huge in India, and certainly there is still a, a, a gap to be bridged uh, in order to reduce costs when we talk about novel technologies. And maybe we'll talk about that later. Yep. Thanks, Mr. Moriniani. I think great thoughts on, on second mover advantage as well as the potential for exports and in local manufacturing. Uh, Mr. Sharma, if you could just yeah. elaborate on your thoughts. See, uh, I come from an oil and gas sector and uh, our company is one of the largest producers of hydrogen. Uh, uh, we are looking uh, at hydrogen from the two, uh, two facets of it. Right? I will say that storage uh, will be a big challenge. So we are starting with the captive use of hydrogen to start with. And in this direction, I would like to mention here that uh, the main issue which is likely to come is the supply of the electrolyzers. Because a lot of companies have taken the initiatives and uh, electrolyzer supply is becoming a big issue uh, as far as the captive use is concerned to start with. Uh, because in the captive use, don't, you don't need storage. So that's a big advantage. You can directly have a buffer vessel and you can use the hydrogen directly. But uh, once you go for the transport sector, then the challenge starts basically. Uh, you have to have storage, you have to have compression. So in line with the supply of electrolyzers, these things will also need to be cracked uh, to have a good storage of hydrogen because as you I can mention here that uh, Department of uh, Energy USA they had set up a target of 7.58 percent of hydrogen storage by 2019 but they have shifted it to 2025 and still the target is about 7.5 that's the maximum target which they have set up so tar storage is becoming a big challenge and uh, in this direction I would like to mention here that a lot of uh, research is required uh, already government has announced the PLI schemes for the electrolyzers and for manufacturing the hydrogen also. Uh, the subsidy will be there for manufacturing electrolyzers, uh, rupees 4400 per kilowatt, staggering down to about 1500 rupees. So that's a very big initiative which has been taken because uh, we are seeing that supply of electrolyzers is becoming a big challenge for us. We are trying to buy some electrolyzers but we are not able to get in time. Uh, our Indian Oil Corporation has already taken initiative. We are setting up a uh, 10,000 tons per annum of electrolyzers. Uh, oil and gas sector has already taken initiatives to set up about 20% of the total 5 million metric ton which has been announced by the Honorable Prime Minister. So we are taking the 20% of that will be set up by complete oil and gas sector in India. So there are challenges in the supply of electrolyzers. Then once it comes to mobility, there will be challenges for storage and compression as well as for the dispenser and other things will also become a challenge. Great thoughts, Mr. Sharma. I think beyond uh, just the ambition, I think getting some of these building blocks right is very, very important. I think that electrolyzer is a starting point, but as you're saying, the rest of the chain will also start feeling constraints as we kind of solve one problem after the other. So great, Th Mr. Lalwani, your, your thoughts, please. Good morning, everyone. Uh, actually, I have, I'm coming from the developer side. So I have a different perspective as far as uh, 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 scaling up the hydrogen uh, production is concerned or uh, derivatives of hydrogen uh, are concerned. The main challenge is actually as a developer what we see is uh, uh, demand creation. Actually a demand uh, of the gas uh, hydrogen is at the nascent stage and uh, to aggregate the demand and uh, to uh, bring the demand that is possible only when we bring down the cost and to reduce the cost we have uh, three actually areas. One is a renewable, other one is a hydrogen, and then derivative downstream side if there is a derivative. So we know that uh, renewable has al almost reached up to the matured level where the uh, still there is a scope of uh, optimization, but renewable is costing almost like a 62 or 63 percent of the uh, hydrogen cost. So that is also required to be re re reduced, but the 
electrolyzer, which is actually this costing high, almost like a 25, 30 percent. So that electrolyzer cost has to come down. That electrolyzer at the moment, both AC as well as a PEM, they are the PEM normally is used, but PEM uh, is having a issue of the rare earth metals which are using radium and the, uh, titanium or the uh, nickel. So all these are very rare earth and very expensive. That is, now the research are going on to reduce the cost of uh, electrolyzer. I think that uh, uh, would be the positive change which is going to happen. But at the same time, I think from the developer side to doing the pilot project, actually pilot projects are nothing but a learning blocks. We can learn the operation issues, we can learn the performance issue, we can learn the efficiency issues. And these pilot projects, at least green hydrogen pilot projects have started, but you might have heard that recently now government is going to start the pilot in the uh, steel and the shipping sector. So pilot, immediately conducting the pilot projects is very important because pilot projects will improve the technology, evolve the technology, and bring the technology to a mature level. So it is very important, like I would say the torrent, uh, we are doing the pilot project in the green hydrogen. While doing the project, we came to, uh, we learned that one, the major issue of gas crossover through the membrane, that gas crossover, it is, you cannot get the full load of range of operation in the AEC. So range of operation is restricted, the turn down is 30%, but because of the membrane gas crossover from hydrogen from the anode side to cathode side, there is a possibility, there is a risk of explosion on the anode side. So this issue, the technical issue, technology issues are need to be addressed immediately so that at least technology reach up to the uh, level where it can be scaled up. So PEM is having an issue with a, a, a high cost and the AEC is having an issue where the gas crossover or the range of operation is quite small. It is not possible actually all OEMs normally give turn down of 30%, but if you really operate, then you get only that 50% of range from 100 to 50%. So these technical challenges which are really possible to discover or identify only during the pilot stage. So pilot, uh, when we are doing, we learn a lot and then try to evolve, uh, improve the technology. So this period, actually what happens in India actually that these all things are happening at the same time. We are uh, improving the technology, we are working on the technology, we are doing the pilot, we are scaling up, we are looking for the market, and all these are happening at the same time, which is, I think, which is little bit challenging at the moment, because normally in all the invention or the, when the technology evolves, you have a time where the technology evolves and then you can scale up, then you can commercialize the uh, business. So in this case, actually, uh, the time is too less to reach up to that one. So that is causing, and there are many things are happening, like uh, if you learn the lesson from the Europe, Europe have hydrogen hub, they have developed, and the bigger hydrogen hubs have come. But India, actually, we have the hydrogen hubs, which are the, if you see that they are smaller in size of our hydrogen hubs. And hydrogen hubs are very important, where the actually user and the producer coexist. And when you coexist, you see that when you have a small transportation uh, length and you can resolve many problems in the, this one. So I think hydrogen hub, more hydrogen hub, or identifying the ports in India where that uh, we can export that, and infrastructure to build in the, at the ports also. It is very important, whether tankage systems or the better derivative tankage system. So I think many things are required to be done on the port side to ensure that we are uh, uh, making the infrastructure for export purpose because if you see if 5 million ton uh, per annum, if you have a target for the 2030, out of the 5 million ton, almost like a 50% component is for the export. And that 50% component, whether how we are going to export the uh, hydrogen, because hydrogen export is also a challenging, whether in the ammonia form or a liquid organic hydrogen uh, carrier through carrier, LOHC. LOHC is also a very good promising technology. Problem is the LOHC, we have not, uh, it requires some time to improve this technology or become a mature 
So LOHC is a very good carrier, but it is very competitive with ammonia uh, as far as hydrogen uh, transport is concerned. So I think future such research or technology development will also help. So in India, I think both on market side, I think there are four things, market, cost reduction, and then developing the infrastructure. And the last item I would say is uh, regulation codes and standards. Regulation codes and standard also, you see the standard. Now, the quality standard of the hydrogen, which are uh, in Europe already, they have declared their quality standard. We have also declared a lot of work is required to harmonize the standard with the other countries so that at least then we will be ready for the export of hydrogen. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lalvani. A pretty comprehensive coverage of the technical and technological issues which need to be solved. In fact, we didn't even touch upon renewable. I think you stayed hydrogen and downstream. There are lots of problems at the renewable side to be sorted as well. Uh, Mr. Malhotra, then your, your thoughts on this, please. Actually, you know, uh, if you have to look at uh, hydrogen economy and you have to roll it out at a faster pace, I don't think that we have to wait only the, for the green hydrogen cost to come down, which we hope will come down to one or two dollars per kg by 2030. But in the interim, I strongly feel that uh, we should be also looking at blue hydrogen. Uh, that's, uh, having said that, uh, we need to focus, continue our focus. The government has been focusing on green hydrogen where five million target has been given uh, for five million tons as the target for 2030. We hope that uh, we will achieve that, uh, but uh, our hydrogen demand by then would be about 13 million tons. So that gap of hydrogen demand in different sectors of our economy will have to be bridged through the blue hydrogen. So, and, and also, we are a cost, uh, you know, sensitive economy. Uh, we can't be, uh, you know, pushing hydrogen at a cost of six dollars per kg or s there won't be acceptability and the demand, creation of demand is also a very big issue. So how to create that demand is one issue on the one hand and reducing the cost of hydrogen production is one. Then there is a cost involved in storage, transportation and distribution of hydrogen which also needs to be accounted for. Government is done doing an excellent work on giving incentives for the production of green hydrogen uh, through the incentivizing of electrolyzers, giving some intense incentives for uh, green hydrogen production. But uh, you know you need compressors, you need storage tanks, infrastructure, pipelines. So these things will also require some type of government support. I agree that government cannot be supporting uh, or incentivizing or subsidizing every, uh, you know, thing in the value chain. Uh, but I think uh, some kind of support in terms of some of the expeditious clearances, etc., uh, or maybe some of the state governments have been supporting uh, giving free land, etc., for setting up electrolyzer units. So those kind of things in policy side uh, are being taken care of. But I think one more uh, issue which uh, in, besides infrastructure is about standards, which he just mentioned. Uh, you know, for storage, we have been, uh, you know, PESO uh, needs to allow 700 bar storage. If you have to roll it out in mobility sector, etc., and you have to increase the range, you have to store in smaller tanks, type 4 cylinders, etc., they need to be focused. And also, uh, in mobility sector, you know, if uh, I, I did some calculation and found that 125 kilometers, if you have to go, you, you need about 25 kilowatt of power at a commercial price of about 8 rupees, you know, you spend 200 rupees. And in a hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, in, in, uh, at a, uh, in 200 rupees, two and a half dollar per kg of cost, you know, you can uh, be competitive. So if you can bring that cost down, use any kind of hydrogen, you will be having more efficiency in terms of hydrogen fuel cells. We are a net importer energy country. So if you can have more efficient devices like fuel cells to be used in mobility sector rather than IC engines based on hydrogen, maybe coming from blue hydrogen, you will be saving on energy. Net energy savings can happen for this country. So I think these are some of the issues on which we need to focus upon and also then we can uh, maybe blue uh, bio hydrogen also is one more thing which I would like to say. Uh, you know, if when we are talk of green hydrogen, it is not only electrolyzer based hydrogen. The the bio hydrogen, we have plenty of biomass available. We have a lot of municipal waste. There are technologies now available which have been developed, and you can even go if you integrate CCUS with that, you can even uh, have negative uh, you know carbon carbon. Uh, 
scenario. So carbon markets creation is the last thing which need to be done because hydrogen will be an elaborate for decarbonization. And when you do decarbonization of any sector, the, the carbon credit scheme which is going to be implemented in this country through the Bureau of Energy Efficiency can incentivize and reduce the cost of hydrogen production, usage, etc. in different sectors. So I think that is also equally important that we, uh, we expeditiously move towards carbon creation of carbon markets, appropriate system of methodologies for measurement of carbon emissions, etc. So I think these are my initial views on this. Thanks, Mr. Babutra. I think I think number of interesting additional themes that you brought in, going into mobility, going into carbon markets, going into the need for supporting infrastructure. Now, a common theme that at least I heard across many of what you were saying was on the technical and the technological challenges. And and this panel in in that sense is uniquely gifted on that theme. Many of you are technologists by nature, are technical kind of problem solvers by nature. As you look at uh, what needs to be done, the challenges that need to be solved, okay, and what breakthrough technologies needs to happen, and do you see anything? Uh, uh, do you see anything that is striking in terms of what needs to be done, and whether there are any near-term solutions that you see are available that we can pick up from the rest of the world? It'll be good to get your uh, thoughts on how how we should be thinking about it from a technical and technological perspective. So maybe we'll go in the same sequence for now, and then then continue the conversation. Yeah, very, very interesting. See, from engineering perspective, I would put one requirement. The lack of codes and standards is always a hindrance for the actual commercial large-scale deployment of any new horizon technology. And uh, when it comes to hydrogen, these are still early days. India has ambitions to export uh, hydrogen. So therefore, we need to harmonize and synchronize our standards with respect to the international standards, those are available. There are several gaps while at uh, Tata Consulting Engineers executing several large projects, first of its kind. What we have felt is the need to develop. Let's take few examples of the categories of the standards wherein we are looking for an active development in the coming years. Number one, let's say hydrogen production. So the electrolytic hydrogen production uh, standards have been adopted from ISO standards. I guess it is IS 16509 that doesn't talk about SOEC, which is a very futuristic technology. The IS standard 16512, which is for the uh, hydrocarbon-based reforming, that uh, also doesn't talk about very emerging technologies like natural gas pyrolysis, or the biomass pyrolysis to generate hydrogen. When it comes to storage, the present IS standard talks for the compressed hydrogen storage only up to 400 liters. So as the hydrogen scale goes on increasing, it is imperative that we develop certain standards which talks about beyond 400 liters. We do not have presently any standard about large scale liquid hydrogen storage. Maybe India can adopt uh, international standards like NFPA 55 or something like that. When it comes to transportation sector, metal hydride storage technology, we do not have any Indian standard as of now. When it comes to distribution segment of the standards, first is the uh, hydrogen piping. So equivalent to ASME B31.12, we do not have any Indian standard with respect to that. Marine time uh, transport of hydrogen, we need to develop several standards. When it comes to the uh, uh, user side or the application side, number of new users of the hydrogen are coming up. So say for example, uh, use of hydrogen in internal combustion engines, engines or the fuel cell qualification and fuel cell certifications. Very basic thing that when hydrogen is used as a heat or as a fuel into the process industry, the basic safety and operational standards needs, needs to be defined. For hydrogen retail outlets, the dispensation standards needs to be defined. So I feel that uh, as we evolve around, around rapid acceleration and deployment of hydrogen technology, from engineering perspective, it is very imperative that emphasis is given on active uh, course and standard development, harmonize it with the international, international standards. That's what I would sum up. That's an interesting theme, uh, Mr. Audrey. And I think, it, 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 logically, Mr. Modignani, a lot of these uh, do we need to learn from scratch? Do we need to build this from uh, in this country? I'm sure there's a lot of learning coming from elsewhere. Your thoughts on what we could adopt as well as other technological themes that you would want to reflect? Um, 
think I, I, I fully agree with, uh, with, your, with your statements. Um, I, would, I would emphasize the fact that we should look probably um, at the development of the hydrogen industry under two angles, the sh short term and longer term. Honestly speaking, on the short term, I do not see major technology breakthrough needed. Uh, electrolysis is there since centuries, right? Uh, the way of storing and transporting and handling hydrogen is known since decades and very well done in the industry. What we need is probably um, innovating business models, uh, an innovative, innovating way of integrating the different pieces of the puzzles. Uh, there are things out there which, by the way, we also have developed among, among others. We have been thinking about small-scale green ammonia, for example, as a concept. It is having a tremendous success. Uh, the innovation there is not in, it, in the technology itself, is in the way uh, we have redesigned uh, the, um, uh, the SIN loop, in the way we have integrated it with the hydrogen value chain in order to capture reasonably uh, uh, small quantities of renewable power. If you want to make 3,000 metric tons per day of ammonia, as many are dreaming, you need 1.5 gigawatt or 2, or 2 gigawatt of, of renewable power. It's not easy to find in one shot, right? So this is the innovation which we should look at probably in the short, in the short term. Uh, other ways, not to forget other ways to produce hydrogen. Uh, we think about green, we think about blue, uh, but hydrogen and syn gas in general can be also produced from degasification of waste. This is also something that we have developed integrating existing technologies. So it is something that is ready in the, in the short term. Then if you look at the, in the, in the longer term, uh, there are certainly breakthrough technologies that, we, that are under development that we should accelerate. You have mentioned uh, um, uh, metal hydrates. That's certain, certainly something that could be applied in certain cases. Uh, there are cases where um, uh, metal hydrate can work both as storage as and compression. Uh, it's, a, it's a combination of the two which can bring some advantages. Then is this technology scalable? Is it going to be cost effective? We have to work on it. Something I, I, I really see as a, as, as a missing, um, as a missing uh, uh, building block in the entire value chain is uh, ammonia cracking. Uh, among, you, have, you have mentioned uh, LOHCs, right? Uh, liquid hydrogen, uh, others, other LOHCs. Today, the main uh, and the most promising uh, hydrogen carrier is ammonia. And I mean, it's, clearly, it, it, it's clear why. Uh, the, the infrastructure is existing. Uh, we know ammonia since decades. It is easy to be transported. There is a market. There, is, there are trading routes, and everything is there, right? So it can be... Uh, hydrogen can serve the production of green ammonia by itself to use green ammonia, but green ammonia can also be a carrier of, of hydrogen. So if you produce hydrogen in India and then you send it to Rotterdam, uh, it can be used as, as, as ammonia, but we must also get hydrogen back as well. So ammonia cracking, it is also something that many companies would be uh, are already working on, and this is an opportunity also to develop. And then the third point, uh, to come to the, uh, to the question of the standards that have been mentioned already a couple of times, is digital. Um, uni make uh, uh, uniform standards and, and, and following the respect of the specifications of hydrogen in terms of quality, in terms of, um, uh, uh, in terms of uh, CO2 emissions, right? direct and indirect CO2 emissions, it's, it's an issue. If you, if you produce uh, a green hydrogen here and you want to sell it into European or US market respecting uh, the, uh, the, uh, um, the standards that are required for the premium price that the final users are going to pay, you have to demonstrate it. So there is a whole of um, a chain to be, to, to be followed, uh, to, to trace and to track, and there are not yet uh, 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 suitable digital tools that uh, can be that, that, that are already in place. So this is also something that the industry and the digital industry, and I think that India is very well placed for that, uh, have to work on. Perfect. 
That's very interesting themes, uh, Mr. Modigliani. Uh, uh, Mr. Sharma, I think you've been looking at this topic very from a very IOCL, oil and gas right. India perspective. So it would be good to get, get your thoughts on this. Yeah. See, uh, I, will, uh, I will take this in two steps. One is the, again captive use and then the transport. So as far as captive use is concerned, again, I would like to mention that uh, though we are using electrolyzers for years, I have been using electrolyzers, maybe we set up first electrolyzer in, at IOC R&D in 2005. So and then we, that was only 5 nm cube per hour, a small electrolyzer. But now the issue I, which I see is the use of electrolyzers at the big scales, like 10,000 tons per annum. That's a very big scale. We are not uh, aware of the reliability and durability of these electrolyzers also at such a scale. So that I see as a big challenge for the electrolyzers for the captive use. Now coming to the uh, standards basically for the, all the refineries and other places like industry, uh, OISD has already made some standards for setting up these electrolyzers. So those are in final stage. So as far as the setting up the electrolyzer is concerned, uh, standards will be in place in time. Now coming to the uh, hydrogen production R&D side, I will say that electrolyzers, we are trying to set up three different types of electrolyzers. One is alkaline, then PEM, and then a solid oxide electrolytic cell, which is a high temperature le electrolyzer. That's a very efficient electrolyzer because in the other types of electrolyzers, one kg of hydrogen, you require about uh, 55 units of electricity. And for solid oxide electrolytic cell, you require about 30 to 32 units. That's a big advantage. So I think we should, India can take a lead in this direction like working on the SOEC rather than going for the other types of electrolyzers. Though we can parallelly work on those also, but I think we should start working in the SOEC side to start with. Uh, and then uh, um, uh, this uh, storage side, I think uh, Indian oil, uh, regarding production also, I would like to mention that Indian oil has already taken initiatives for biomass gasification also. So we are trying to use biomass for production of hydrogen. We are getting some good results. We are getting about 8 to 9 kgs of hydrogen per kg of biomass, per 100 kg of biomass. So that's about 10 percent. We are uh, 10 kg of hydrogen per 100 kg of biomass. So 10 percent of uh, conversion is there. So that's a very good pathway for producing uh, green hydrogen again. Uh, coming to hydrogen storage, Indian oil has taken uh, initiatives again in this direction. Uh, we are working with the uh, Institute of Technology Kharagpur. We have developed a 350 bar hydrogen storage tank, which is a type 3 cylinder. So that is uh, already developed indigenously and it is under testing in the US labs. So once it is done, I think we can take it forward. We are also trying to start in, uh, take initiative in the direction of type 4 cylinders. Because uh, see, uh, there are type 1, type 3, type 4 cylinders. So type 1 can be used for stationary application. But once you go for automobile application, you have to have some uh, type 3 or type 4. They are smaller and low weight cylinders. So we have to work on those uh, types of storage options. As also said that liquid uh, LOSC and other uh, hydrogen storage options are also being worked upon. Already Cheoda has developed one based on toluene and cycloaxin. They have already developed one technology. But the issue I see in these type of technologies is that uh, you have to have, if you are using it for a uh, maybe a, a retail outlet or hydrogen supply for the vehicles, then you have to have a small plant at the retail outlet also to produce hydrogen back from the uh, either toluene or cycloaxin. So those type of things are uh, will be a challenge to, for using these type of supply of hydrogen uh, uh, for the uh, for the other different applications. Uh, what I see is the ultimately we have to go for hydrogen pipelines in a big way. So that I see that is the safest and best way best way to go for hydrogen transportation. That's, that's a pretty comprehensive coverage, Mr. Sharma. Thank you for that. Uh, Mr. Lalwani, in fact, in your opening statement, you'd already covered a lot of the technical and technological challenges. It'll be good to see, since you cover the entire value chain from RE uh, through to hydrogen and also consumption at CGD, what else do you see as, as technological breakthroughs that you need? Yeah. So, uh, I will start with the RE, actually. Uh, now, the main problem of the RE is... Just come closer to the mic, please. I think it'll be useful. Yeah. Main problem of the RE actually is uh, its vulnerability to uh, variable power. Its variability is there. It is not uh, uh, rather the steady state power. So there is a variability because of the resources, either because of the solar is because of the radiation and, uh, and wind turbine is because of the wind speed. So both uh, these are the variabilities are the major challenges which we get and to 
to make it RTC or the round the clock at the steady state, you need the storage. So there are two options are available. How to improve that one? That is through the battery storage and another is through the pump storage. Now, at the moment, base is a bit, little bit uh, uh, expensive than the pump storage project. So most of the now uh, developers are focusing how to uh, use the pump storage project, uh, pump, uh, plants to make it uh, a little bit RTC to the maximum possible. Even at a 90% availability of the RTC, price now at the moment the price is going more than 4.5 rupees or 5 rupees with a pump storage projects. But if you add the base or the bat battery energy system, then it is going above 6, six rupees. So in that case, if this is going to happen to have a RTC and have a steady power supply, there is a, uh, there is a increase in the cost of the power or the price of the uh, uh, power, which increases the hydrogen cost. So in that case, how to minimize that one, how to have the RTC at the same time. So something is required to be done on the electrolyzer. Something so that at least there should be a trade-off between the electrolyzer operation and the uh, renewable uh, variability. So in that case, some at least some level of variability you can accommodate in the electrolyzer. So some flexibility is required in the design of the electrolyzer which can accommodate this variability. Because this variability are sometimes very adverse, you have to shut down the electrolyzer. So in that case, even with a battery energy storage, you should bring down to the RTC level of 85 to 90% which gives a, a tariff of almost like a 4.5 or 4.7 rupees per unit, then, then also that you get the hydrogen of uh, almost like a 5.5 dollar per kg. So in that case, how to improve that variability in that one? So major problem in the AEC is that membrane, the membrane which is initially it was a 460 micron, now it is being reduced so that at least that one uh, resistance or the uh, between the uh, electrodes can be minimized or current de density can be increased. When they increase the current density, you are going to uh, get that better efficiency. Now, current density at the moment, all the AEC are around in the range of 0.2 to 0.5 ampere per centimeter square. So, this current density is need to be improved to improve the efficiency. Now, so AEC, this current density. Will definitely there are some uh, research are going on, but it is expected by 2030, this current density may reach up to 2 ampere per centimeter square. So uh, one is on uh, this AEC and other, previously I said about the gas crossover, which these are the two issues, these are to be addressed in the AEC. And on the PAME side, that cost to be reduced by reducing that major cost is there in the A PEM is because of the bipolar plates, which is between the two electrodes. These are made of uh, titanium. So there actually the titanium uh, is the major uh, cost in the PEM. That is to be reduced. And the PTL also, PTL is also is expensive and it is a, it's because of the uh, titanium cost. <coughs> so now that one Toshiba, is doing a lot of research. If you see the research paper, Toshiba has found the alternate material to address this issue of bipolar plates and the PTL. That will bring down the cost almost of the pain by 90%. I think some of you might have seen this research paper. So this would be a good, uh, I think, uh, technology uh, development as far as PAM is concerned. And I think SOEC is already, we talked, SOEC is very, preferred technology, but I think it is not matured, but it is going to become a future. With the SOEC and the PAME, I think uh, next one is AEM is going to come, and an ion exchange membrane uh, module, uh, electrolyzer. So that will be the, if this efficiency is improving, and at the same time, life, at the moment, the life cycle is almost like a eight, eight years or nine years. So life cycle is also to be increased. Stack life, I am saying, the stack life. And the, th the other area of the technology, technology is iridium. Iridium is actually limited in the world. So recycling of the iridium, actually research are going on how to recycle the iridium. 
So there also the works are going on. So that is on the electrolyzer. <clears throat> and on ammonia plant also, I will say something. At the moment, all the ammonia plants are normally in the fertilizers or in the refineries or SMR base. ST methane reforming. But this change which has happened, if, if you see none of the plant is at the moment commercially operating or maybe operating in somewhere at the lower capacity, which is working directly from the gas from the electrolyzer to the, da, uh, to the uh, ammonia plant. So there is a little bit change in the process of the SMR also. There also technology is not scaled up. Although the licensor are claiming that uh, commercially available, uh, but it is there also some research is required to increase the derivative of the, uh, uh, to have the derivative option for the export also. So this is, I would say, Thank you. Thank you, Mr. there are issues and uh, technological issues. These can be addressed progressively as we uh, evolve the technology. Thank you, Mr. Langley. That is very comprehensive coverage across the chain and very necessary if you want to meet the standard of 2kg, uh, especially some of the aspects that you spoke about on electrolyzer side. Mr. Malhotra, you are very closely in touch with academia, with, with research institutes as well on an ongoing basis. Your thoughts on, the, on this would also be very uh, appreciated. Actually, you know, uh, on uh, the electrolyzer side, uh, a lot of talk has already been uh, mentioned. You know, you need to improve efficiency, you have to have new technologies, you have to have the better utilization, uh, that's also important. So the government on policy side, they have done the interstate transmission charges, waiver, etc. So those things, uh, I will just add on bio-hydrogen, uh, uh, you know, there's, there's an opportunity which I also mentioned if you are talking in terms of green hydrogen. Then, uh, you know, maybe one more thing which uh, has not been mentioned is about microalgae. Uh, when you talk of uh, algae uh, is about 50 times productivity of switchgrass. You know, you can, uh, if, if uh, that uses the sunlight and the CO2, so CO2 also is getting absorbed, you can get microalgae at a much uh, larger quantities in small area. Uh, if that technology is focused upon in R&D more, you know, although some R&D has been going on, but I think we need to focus more on, on production of microalgae. Then we can produce large quantities of hydrogen uh, through a cleaner route, and that will be absorbing CO2 also. Having said that, I also mentioned in my initial remarks about blue hydrogen too, uh, and the green hydrogen, in my view, will have to piggyback on, on blue hydrogen for, for some time, you know, till such time the green hydrogen costs come down. So in that context, India has large reserves of coal also. I chaired a committee on coal to hydrogen where we did mention that the cost of uh, coal to hydrogen is pretty, pretty low. And since we need low cost hydrogen to create infrastructure to roll out hydrogen economy in the initial phases till such time the green hydrogen comes down, uh, we can produce coal to hydrogen at about 1 to 1.5 dollars a kg. That's the estimate which has been made. And you can, you can, and the gasification technology, initially it was thought that Indian coal is high ash and technologies are not available. On that technology front, some of the, uh, you know, projects on, on coal gasification have been done by, by some of the companies in India and successfully gasified that through fluidized uh, gasifiers. And syngas, you get CO plus H2 and then water gas shift reaction, you can get hydrogen. Then further, whatever CO2 is coming out, we also need to focus upon developing CCU technologies, CCUS or CCU. I particularly like CCU because I think the, the, we should not treat carbon as a, as a waste. We should convert it into some useful chemicals. We should monetize that carbon. And once we do that, I think the cost will also, the com cost compensation, whatever you incur on CCU, uh, you know, can be recovered through the utilization of that carbon. So CCUS technology needs to be focused upon. Because if you do it along with biomass, uh, biohydrogen, you can have negative kind of uh, CO2. So if we have to go to net zero or accelerate our move to net zero, I think uh, there is no option but to focus upon these kind of technologies. Uh, I think uh, on the utilization side, on uh, vehicle side, I, I also mentioned, in the fuel cells, there is a lot of scope for, uh, for innovation. Actually, India has been focusing more on battery electric vehicles, but I feel that the hydrogen fuel cell vehicles can reduce the CO2 emissions further by 67% of 
of you know whatever you are doing with uh, with uh, battery electric vehicles electrification because you are using grid power and grid power is based on coal thermal power at this point of time you know if you gasify that coal rather than burning it in the thermal power plants gasify it and convert it into hydrogen and use it in hydrogen fuel cells i think uh, and even in ic engines i think you are going a remarkable job in reducing the carbon emissions and accelerating our move to net zero so i think these are some of the thoughts which come to mind okay. and fuel cell developments you need some <coughs> catalyst development you uh, you have to reduce the uh, <coughs> dosage of catalyst and also the membranes these are the uh, costly areas so or if we can develop some low cost fuel cells based on innovative <coughs> catalyst and reduce cost of membrane i think the we will have a very successful story to write in in terms of energy transition great th thanks mr malhotra for i think that, that those are options are very inspiring uh, we we have a red flashing screen in front of us that says times up so i don't think we have uh, opportunities for each of us to give closing comments but on behalf of the panel i think what uh, while we focused on a very specific set of areas today uh, largely focused on the practitioners and the implementers challenges on the ground of getting green hydrogen to take off i think the benefit of having this particular panel today here was because they are they have seen it they have done it and they are facing the challenges today and we have a concrete set of issues that we need to address uh, look hopefully these are these are topics that we can uh, address over the next few years to help hydrogen take off in the country appreciate all of your thoughts and 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 kind of uh, uh, contributions have a great and india energy week for the rest of the days thank you